My mother was an author, and when I was young she did most of her writing in the kitchen. She had a table set up in the middle of the room with her typewriter. And she'd sit there typing away, and we'd come running in with all our childhood emergencies. And she'd stop, and she'd take care of them, and she'd go back to her writing. And someone once asked her how she was able to get her writing done, and she said, well, she didn't have an ivory tower. She had an ivory intersection. The middle of the house, the place where everybody was coming past, that's where she did her writing. And it's a good image for our meditation. We're in the middle of an intersection here, and we have to learn how to create the ivory part, the part where we can have a space for ourselves to do the work that's really important. Because the world comes at us with all kinds of pressing issues, and we often mistake something that's pressing for something that's important. And as a result, the really important things don't get done. And sometimes we think, well, if I take care of everything else and everything else gets settled and tied down and tied up, and then I can find some time for the mind. But if you wait until that point, you'll never get around to the mind, because there's always going to be something that's going to come pressing on you. So you have to learn how to develop some mental seclusion, your ability to pull yourself away from your pressing responsibilities, and make the mind your top priority. You've probably found, as you come here, even when there's physical seclusion, thoughts about work, thoughts about family. What in time they call 108 different issues all come rushing in. And even if we were to put up seven fortress walls around the monastery, those thoughts could still come in and invade your mind, invade your meditation. And even more so when you're actually in the midst of it, when there is no physical seclusion at all. But you've got to learn how to develop this mental seclusion, the ability to say no to those things. And that involves having the right attitude, remembering that there are only so many things you can be responsible for. You have limited resources, limited en energy, limited time on this earth. You've probably seen people who were strong-willed, physically strong, mentally strong, who reach a point where they get so old and their strength is no longer there, like old flowers that fade away. And so it's such a shock. You know, what happened to that strength? Where, where it seemed so strong at the time. And for many, many years, these people seemed strong. And it's just not there anymore. We have to realize that could happen to you very easily. So we only have so much time. And you're going to have to, have to ask yourself, okay, when your physical strength goes and when strength of the brain goes. What kind of strength of mind will you have? Where will your refuge be at that point? You've got to develop that refuge now. That's your top priority. The Buddha's image is not of an intersection. The image is of an island surrounded by a flood. You can't wait for the flood to go down, but you can develop your island and develop a solid foundation there. This is why we work with the the body in and of itself, feelings, mind states, mental qualities in and of themselves, looking at these things as events in the present moment, and learning how to be ardent about it. In other words, not just being here, but also learning how to develop what's skillful, and then try to fend off the floodwaters. If you do have to get out and row your boat around in the flood, Realize you can't be out in the flood forever. You've got to come back here. This is where your strength lies. This is where your nourishment lies. And however much you may want to be responsible for other people in your family and your work, there's only so much strength you have. 
And if you don't look after your own strength, you're also letting them down. So that voice that says you, should, you don't keep thinking about these things and worrying about these things, you're irresponsible. You've got to come back and say, look, looking after the mind is your number one responsibility. Because if the mind starts breaking down, then how are you going to take care of other people? It's like a tool that you need in, in your occupation. You've got to take really good care of your tools if you let them get broken or dull. Then you can't do your occupation. So the time it takes to stop and sharpen your knives, keep your other tools clean and in good order, that's time well spent. Even though you may not be working on your job at that point, still this is an important preparation so that you can do your job well. So remember, the mind always has to take a top priority. So you have to have the right attitude and then the right place to keep the mind so it really does get some strength here in the present moment. If you simply force it to be here, it's going to start rebelling and it's not going to get the nourishment that it could get. One of the sad things about the way Dharma is often taught, and this is not just here in America, sometimes you see it in Asia as well, that's a downgrading of concentration, saying that concentration is a side path and it takes too long and it's too hard for people who live busy lives. That wasn't how the Buddha taught at all. You want to develop concentration as your primary element of the path, because it's nourishment for the mind, it's food for the mind. It's what enables all the other factors to become right. I mean, you use the other factors to make your concentration right, but the concentration, it was the first element in the path that the Buddha himself discovered. And the well-being, the sense of rapture and fullness that feed the mind as you get the mind to settle down and have a really good place to settle. These are the qualities that enable you to stay on the path. And John Fuhn compared the sense of ease and fullness of the, the breath, the ease and fullness of the rapture, as the lubricant for your meditation. So otherwise, the motor of your practice is going to seize up. So you have to work with the breath, play with the breath, experiment. It gives you nourishment. And it keeps you interested in the present moment as well. Otherwise the present becomes a very dull place to be, and when it's dull the mind is not going to stay. It's going to wait for its opportunity to slip back to other things that seem more pressing, or at least more interesting. But here you're working with the breath energy, which is directly related to the health of your body. And the sense of ease and well-being that you can create, that's directly related to the health of the mind. So you've got to learn how to develop your sense of priorities. This is the number one priority. You can't wait for everything else to get settled down before you work on this. This has to come first. And if there are issues you have to think about, okay. Remind yourself that the mind, when it's been well fed and well rested, is in a much better position to deal with those things than if you just take everything on all at once. So if you've got something that really is important that you've got to deal with, well, remind yourself at the end of the meditation. You can give yourself five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, and then you'll think about the issue. You might pose the issue at the beginning of the meditation. Remind yourself this is something important we'll have to think about. And now for the rest of the hour, we're not going to think about it at all until the time comes at the end of the meditation. Then you give yourself some time to let those thoughts come up and see what the mind has to say when it's in a better, better state to look at those issues. And at the same time, you have to learn how to take at least some fragment of the nourishment of the breath with you as you go through the day. We were talking about this earlier. Try to notice where in the body tension tends to tighten up first. Might be in your chest, in your stomach, in the middle of the head, in your neck, 
your shoulders. And if you know your spot, then try to keep in touch with that spot as you go through the day. Just notice the quality of energy there. And when you sense it tightening up, just take a few seconds to allow things to relax. Learn how to develop that release response, the relaxation response, they call it. Learn how to be quick at it. And give yourself little meditation breaks as you go through the day. After all, you take snacks for the body. Well, this is a snack for the mind. Time to stop and just be by yourself. Drop all your other responsibilities. Because you can't take the whole world on your shoulders. Of course, we may not be taking the whole world, but we tend to take a healthy chunk. Sometimes it is a good exercise in humility to realize that there's only so much you can do and only so much you know. I mean, one of the first steps in wisdom is realizing there's a lot you don't know. As the Buddha said, that recognizing your own foolishness. When you recognize that you're foolish about things, that's at least to that extent you're wise. We're here to overcome ignorance. If we don't admit that we have ignorance, we're not going to be able to deal with it. Ignorance isn't just not knowing, it's thinking you know things when you don't. And another part of developing wisdom is realizing that you can only take on so many responsibilities. You've got to realize, what is really my responsibility? And if you're taking on other things that are not really your responsibility, learn how to let them go. And this is an issue that deals with daily life, and it goes deeper and deeper into the practice. The whole issue of what kind of suffering you can actually cure, what kind of suffering you can actually gain release from. And there's the the suffering and stress from the three characteristics, just the fact that things change. You can't stop that. But then there's the suffering that comes from your craving and clinging, and that's something you are responsible for and something you can do something about. So these basic principles about everyday wisdom apply deeper and deeper into the practice, so don't overlook them. But you learn how to get a sense of what you're responsible for and what you can handle in day-to-day -day life, you also get some very important lessons that go deeper into releasing the mind from even the most subtle stress and suffering that it can create. So the meditation here is your ivory intersection. Things are going to come around, come through. Little kids are going to come crying in because their older brothers have bullied them or they've fallen down and hurt themselves. And you take care of it, and then you get back to your breath. Because it's only in the midst of things that you can actually work on the mind. If you wait till everything is settled, you're going to be dead. Because that's life is in the midst of things. You're trying to find a place, your own island, in the midst of the flood. The breath in and of itself, the body in and of itself. Ardent, alert, and mindful. Putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That's the traditional formula. The world is still there, it's just you're learning how to put aside your greed and distress around the issues of the world. That's what keeps you on your island. And it's an island you can take with you when you go.